the Word of God. Yes, I know we do. I know that we do, and I, I appreciate you for it. I uh, got a little bit of a different message in the sense that it chronicles a story that is here. And I want to say, by the way, it's good to have the Littles back home. They've been vacating, and uh, so it's good to have them back. God bless you guys. Miss you when you're not here. Amen. They're, they've just been here for a little while, but they're just, they're just part of the part of the group right now, part of the family. Amen. And we're so thankful for them. A turn with me, if you would, please. We're going to the book of Acts. And I want to just uh, look at a little story here that's very familiar to uh, probably each and every one of us. And if it's not, if we want to go down through. And, and, and there are many, many principles to be found. You know, you can find principles to live by, not only in the doctrines of the Word of God, the teachings teachings of the Word of God, but even in the stories that are told, the Old Testament are filled with them. And here is a very remarkable story about the Apostle Paul as, uh, you know, he's making his way to stand before the authorities at Rome. And so I know you just sat down, but could I ask you to stand one more time, please, in honor of the Word of God. And uh, we're going to be reading Acts 28. I'm going to begin my reading at verse 1, and we're going to read down 2 and through verse 11. All right, here we go. Uh, Josh, good to see you back there. Praise God. Good to have you here, man. Glory to God. So I saw you come in and uh, failed to recognize you, but we're so glad that you are here. Okay, here we go. Acts chapter 28, verse 1. And when they were escaped... Now, the context, there's been a massive shipwreck, and they've lost everything except their lives. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people, let me say here that, uh, that in the King James, when they say barbarous, the Greeks considered anybody that did not speak Greek as barbarous. So it doesn't mean in the sense that we may think of it, but it just simply means somebody that did not speak the Greek language. Okay? So that's what it's referring to here. So these barbarous people showed us no little kindness in other words, a lot of kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. It's winter time. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper, a serpent out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the individuals of the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hands, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, the shipwreck, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. In other words, uh, you know, karma, it's going to come around. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked to when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said, You know, he's no longer a murderer, he's a god. Boy, we change our minds a lot, don't we? by what we see, but we need to only change our minds by what the Lord deals with us. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, the governor, whose name was um, uh, Publius, uh, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publicus lay sick of a fever and a bloody flux, a dysentery, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. 
So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laid at us with such things as were necessary. They lost everything. So they gave them everything that they would need to continue on, all of them. And then the Bible says in verse 11, And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered the owl whose sign or, um, you know, the uh, figure rings out on the very uh, head of the ship, uh, Castor and Pollux. You may be seated. Praise God. Now, once again, it's a remarkable story of the protection of Almighty God. But I, I, I want to preach this morning simply on, it's going to be easy to get a handle on because it's only one word. And I want to preach this morning on ready. Are you ready? Am I ready? I believe, and as we look at the victorious outcome of the Revolutionary War, going back many, many years at the very start of this nation, I believe that that victorious outcome was due to the fact, maybe partially or maybe even largely to the fact that there was a militia, a group of men who came from all different kinds of backgrounds and they were involved in all kinds of vocations, but they prided themselves that when the cry went out, they could be ready to go out and fight in a moment's notice. They were constantly ready, and hence we know the minute men. Now, as you read about the Revolutionary War, you know that uh, the Americans, we were grossly outnumbered from the very very beginning. Uh, but it's amazing that I believe with the supernatural help of the Lord as well in establishing this nation that the few brought about some very magnificent and wonderful victories. Uh, and, and I cannot overstate it and I don't want to understate the fact. And I believe that a lot of reason for that is because of the people in that day their readiness, their readiness. They were ready. They were willing to sacrifice. They were ready to march out and to move forward in a moment's time. Now, I thought of all of that when I read this text. Because there is one subject that threads its way through the entire fabric of this particular text. And it is that of ready ready now the Bible is replete also with exhortations that God wants us his people he wants us to be always ready I guess one of the main uh, uh, talking points, you might say, that of where we need to be ready is for the coming of the Lord, the imminency of Jesus. We don't know when he's coming back. And so consequently, uh, the cry goes out, be ready, be ready, be ready. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man of God is going to come back. But the Bible also tells us that not only to be ready for the coming of the Lord, the Apostle Paul said, I'm ready to be offered up. Uh, he was ready to die. We never know how we're going to ta be taken out of this life and the end is going to come. The Bible tells us to be ready for the enemy. He's going to be coming against us to be watching and to be waiting. The Bible tells us uh, to be ready to step out and tell others about Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us to be ready to live a life of separation and that which is pleasing into the eyes of the Lord. I could go on and on and on. Ready, 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 ready. Now as we look at this passage of Scripture, 
I want to pull out five things so I can't linger long on all of them, uh, but uh, just to give us a taste here of uh, what he is referring to about being ready. And it not only speaks about the readiness of us, but it speaks of there are other things that are ready that surround us, and therefore we need to be ready for their readiness. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? Ready, ready. The first thing that I want us to notice here, and I, I uh, trust that it is something that we can relate to about being ready, <clears throat> is first of all, there was a servant who was ready to serve. I'm referring here to the Apostle Paul. Now, keep in mind, I've already referenced it, but they, they took off on this cruise, if you will, in this ship. And uh, really, it wasn't a good time for them to go. They went anyway. Uh, they got in a storm, and they lost the ship. They lost the goods. They lost everything except their lives and the clothing that was on their back. And they were able to get to shore by the promise of the Lord that none of them would die. And we see then that here the indigenous people here, and, and Melita is a very small island. It only is about 60 miles circumference. Uh, so it's very, very small. But that's where they landed, and the people there, uh, they built them a fire. Notice it's raining, it's in the winter time. That's when storms come up. That's why it's not a good time to be sailing especially uh, in that area. And uh, so you can see the circumstance. They had built a fire. They're trying to keep them warm. You can imagine being in the sea and, and it's cold and they get them out and they're wet. They're tired. They're weary. So they build this fire. And the Apostle Paul is around it warming himself as everybody else is. But as Paul, in his mind, sees the fire begin to wane, die out a little bit, nobody asked him, nobody told him, you know, he's incarcerated on this ship. And they could have said, hey, you're the one to go get the sticks and the wood for the um, uh, for the fire. Uh, but no, nobody had to tell him. And the Apostle Paul, he immediately went out and he picked up some sticks and placed them on the fire. Now church, what I'm referring to here is that the Apostle Paul was a servant of God. And, and in that attitude of servant, we refer to servant, but the actual rendering in, in, in the Word of God, it means a slave. He was a love slave unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and anybody that has a servant spirit, uh, you don't have to tell them to serve. You don't have to tell them to try to alleviate the hurt or the pain or the misery of those around them. You remember Jesus said to his disciples that the greatest among you is whom? Is the servant of all. I like to put it this way. You know, if people are great in grandeur in our society and around the world, they have all kind of servants serving them. But here's the way Jesus puts it. The greatest among you is not determined by how many servants serve you, but it's how many people you serve. There is a vast difference. And that was the Apostle Paul. He had a heart of service, and so should we have a heart of service unto God. That, that in a moment's time, that when God opens the opportunities, we go about our day and we have no idea what's going to unfold or what's going to come our way. But praise God, when those opportunities come, we need to be ready to serve of the Lord and our fellow man in 
any way that we possibly can. Now, the great thing that I like about Paul here is that in this story, there were, there were two circumstances of service. One, he went and he gathered up the sticks. Paul's saying, you know what? There's nothing beneath me. I don't feel myself better. I'll do the menial task. I'll do whatever is there. But then later on, he's taken into the governor's house and there he's able to heal the governor's father. And the Bible said that the word began to get out and people from all over the, the island came to have Paul to pray for them and the Lord healed them. So you see, in one sense, it's a very lowly job, but in the other sense, uh, you know, there be a lot of people that would like to be a servant like that where people's come to you and you have the power to lay hands on them and see them healed. But you see, that's the great thing about a servant. It's not about the uh, service or the activity that you're going to serve in. Uh, the service itself rendered as unto God is good enough. And that's exactly what Paul told Timothy, the young pastor, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul talking about vessels, that we're all vessels to be used of the Lord. And he said, a vessel here that is in the hands of the Lord to be used of the Lord, that this vessel, it needs to be of honor. And then he goes on and he says two things. It's meat for the master's use. That word meat there, it means it's ready. It's fit. It's ready to be used of God. Uh, even more clearly, it means to be easily used. To be ready to be used, easily used. And then he said the second thing, equipped for every good work. Did you notice how he qualified the work of the service of what we are to do? Every, can't get it going here, but uh, my, maybe my battery's dead, but good, good work. You see, it doesn't matter if it's in the public or if it's in the private. It doesn't matter if anybody sees you or nobody uh, knows. It doesn't matter whether you get rewards down here for it or not. None of that is relevant for a servant that is ready to serve. If it is a good work and it's there before you, you are ready to undertake and to do whatever it is that God wants you to do. Somebody say amen. Yes. Hallelujah. A servant that's ready to serve. But not only do I see a servant that's ready to serve, I see a serpent that's always ready to strike. When he brought the sticks and he laid them on the fire, the serpent to this venomous beast, a highly venomous snake that was there aroused and came out and latched itself onto the hand of the Apostle Paul and no doubt wound itself around his arm. And by the indication, although it's not just exactly referenced from the indication of uh, the response of the people there, uh, that it bid him. There is a serpent that is always ready to strike. Now church, I don't have to I don't have to get into a long dissertation here about who the serpent is that's always ready to strike and to kill and steal uh, from us everything that God has done in our lives. We preached a whole series about it not too long ago, uh, but the metaphor was different. Paul talked about in the military, we're in the battle. The enemy is the Lord. Uh, the, the enemy of the Lord is the devil himself. And when you look at the serpent, he goes all of the way back to the garden. 
We remember that it was the serpent who was more subtle than any other beast, the Bible says. And it was the serpent that beguiled and uh, that uh, tricked, if you will, Eve uh, in the sinning. And uh, along with Adam and throwing all of mankind into this mess of sin in which we live today. But not only all the way from the beginning, the serpent, the serpent that was against mankind. But you go all the way to the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 12 and 6, which is simply one of the references, there, there are a couple of others. But the, the apostle John, as he's writing, he sees this beast that's cast out of heaven. And he said, uh, uh, who is this old beast? The old serpent, he says. The devil, Satan himself. And church, let me tell you here today, it doesn't matter the metaphor. It doesn't matter whether it's a lion seeking, uh, roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, whether it is a serpent, whether it's in military, and there's others. But there is the enemy that is always there ready to strike us and to hinder us in any way that we can in our service unto the Lord. Are you hearing me? It doesn't matter what we strive to do for the Lord. The devil is there to hinder. I, we, we laugh a lot. You know, my grandpa Goldison, uh, when uh, he was trying to work, work his sawmill and, and some of the other things, his little farm he had gone on there, uh, but he would go out and things weren't going well. He'd say, the old devil won't let you do anything. <laughs> And that's how we feel sometimes. Opposition, opposition, opposition striking of where of that he can hinder in any way that he can. So let me just tell you again and again and again. There is a Satan, there is an enemy that hates us with all of his heart. And he's out there and he's ready not only to strike your individual life, but he's ready to strike your family. He wants to destroy your relationships. He's out there and he's ready to strike your health with sicknesses and diseases. He's ready to strike your finances. He's ready to strike uh, uh, your job. He's ready to strike uh, just in your service to the Lord, whatever it may be. And we know that when, when a venomous snake, that, that when it bites you, that it's only one place in which the venom is injected, but then that venom begins to flow through the entirety of our body. Now, church, that's why that we as a church... You see, it may be a little more difficult. I can determine what my personal relationship with God, but I, I can't uh, make you do or anyone else. And even the Lord and the Holy Spirit won't do it. And that's why that it is so uh, very important that all of us are ready to be watching the enemy, not allow him to even get a toehold or any type of advantage in. Because you see, a lot of times it only takes one individual to be struck unawares by the enemy and then that venom is spread through the entirety of the body of Christ. So the enemy is always ready. A serpent that is ready to strike. Not only is there a servant that's always ready to serve, a serpent that is ready to strike, but there's always a Savior that's ready to save. I love this part. I love this part. 
when the snake venomous highly venomous snake it struck Paul and notice there that immediately the people of the island said he's a murderer and in their mind this was vengeance this he had done something this guy is a murderer and so uh, you know it's coming back around and he's gonna he's gonna be destroyed himself he killed somebody and he's gonna be killed himself but the Bible said that as they watched him, not only did he fall down to the ground in weakness or pass out, uh, but the Bible said that his hand didn't even swell. I'm telling you, we have a Savior that is ready to save us regardless of the circumstance and the situation that we find ourselves. I know we use the word saved. We may even ask people, are you saved? And I'll, I'll never forget, I was reading that when uh, Liberty University, when they started getting bigger and having a, uh, a football team and some more other teams, uh, the, you know, he would, uh, uh, the coach said, he said, we would go out and we would talk about being saved. And he said, a lot of the guys thought, are you saved uh, from drowning in the swimming pool? What kind of saved are you talking about? But you see, when we talk about saved, we think in terms of spiritually. The Lord has saved us from hell. The Lord has saved us from this old sin. And why wouldn't we initially think of that? But yeah, as you go through the Word of God, the word saved, it means to deliver. And I just simply want to tell you again that we have a Savior that is ready to save us. He does not slumber. He does not sleep. Uh, he never walks even out of the room the Bible says he'll never leave us or forsake us. And so it means that even for a little while, he is always there. And when we find ourselves in situations that we have absolutely no control over and nothing that we can do, he is ready to save us. Reach out his hand and deliver us. Now, church, I'm telling you, when God does it, He does it in the best way possible. When, when I was reading that again, and I, I read about where His hand was not even swollen. And did you notice the Bible said He simply shook it off? It kind of reminds me of the three Hebrew children that, th that was thrown into the fiery furnace. The Bible said not only were they not burned, but when they came out, their clothes didn't even have the smell of smoke on it. And so here he's saying, not only did Paul not die, but his hand didn't even swell up. We had an old mongrel of a dog when I was a kid. And uh, we, we just, we were out in the country, not really close to anybody, so we let him run. And uh, he, he would just go everywhere. One evening he came home and his head was swollen up twice the size of what it was normal. His eyes was almost shut. And, uh, you know, we... Uh, we just thought, well, he's a goner. He's not going to make it. And so he laid around for a long time, and we tried to help him any way that we could, but <clears throat> we were sure. We knew he'd been bitten by um, some kind of venomous snake, and uh, so we weren't sure, uh, but we thought he was going to die. But he, he made it. Praise God. The old mongrel of a dog. He made it. 
But you see, that's the thing with God. Sometimes He allows us to go through more severe things. But if He has the choosing and the desire uh, that when He delivers and saves us, He's able to save us to the nth degree uh, that there's no ill effect. We're able to shake it off uh, without any ill effect and keep on keeping on for the Lord. Hallelujah. No ill effect. Just shake it off. And so that's what I want to tell you today. We have a Savior that's ready to help us, encourage us, bless us, save us. So whatever you're going through, whatever the enemy has struck you with, shake it off by the power of the Holy Spirit and keep on moving for the Lord. So there's a, a servant that's always ready to serve. There's a serpent that's always ready to strike. But there's a savior that's always ready to save. Here's one. There's always somebody that's ready to speak. Have you ever noticed that everybody has an opinion on everything? And not only do they have an opinion, but they're ready always to vocalize that opinion. <laughs> when they saw that he had been struck by the serpent immediately. He's a murderer! You're a murderer! Well, then when that didn't happen and he lives, you're a God. You're a God. Yeah. One of the best advice, pieces of advice that I ever received when I was in Bible college is that one of the individuals there in the class and I don't even remember what class but he said this he said when you are in ministry and and it's not just for ministry it's everybody now with all of the media that's out there and people putting everything out there he's saying but back then especially in ministry People are always going to have something to say about you. Sometimes they're going to call you every name in the book. But there's others that's going to applaud you and lift you up and give you accolades and applause. And he said, I would challenge you to not take either one of them to heart. Simply allow it to go in one ear and out the other. Now, of course, of course, if it's criticism, go to the Lord and see if that criticism has weight to it. And if it does, then get it right with God. But if it's just people talking to talk, they have no clue what's going on. But they have an opinion of who you are based upon your action or non-action. And they'll tell everybody that will listen and even those that will not not listen. And he said, just don't allow that to affect you. And then those that, that would lift you up and say good things about them, thank them and how much you appreciate them for saying it, but immediately get back on your face before God and say, God, every applause goes to you. And I'm grateful and I'm thankful unto you. Listen, church, the devil doesn't care how he takes us down. Whether it's people talking 
talking badly about us or whether it's others lifting us up and we begin to think we're somebody we're not and we can do it without God. It doesn't matter who it is. Somebody's always ready to speak. But you and I need to be ready to have a response that is according to the Word of God and that is led of God as well. Somebody is always ready to speak. I'm going to close, but let me give you one more ready here. Think about it. There's a servant that's always ready to serve. Is that you? Is that me? Sadly, there's a serpent that's always ready to strike. We need to be ready for that as well, church. But there's a Savior that's always ready to save. By His grace, His mercy, His power, shake it off and keep on going for the Lord. There's somebody that's always ready to speak ill or good about us. It's not what other people says about us that counts. It's what God is going to say about us when we stand before Him that counts. Well done. You're a good and faithful servant. But in verse 11 and the last verse here, and I'm closing, there's always a ship that's ready to sail. Now you're not you're not running the aisles yet. Pastor, there's a ship that's always ready to sail. Nobody really went to Melita on purpose. It's a small out of the way place south south of Sicily. And of course, it had the few folks that lived there. And yeah, there were people that would uh, maybe go there or whatever. But but it was it was never in the course of trade. It was never in the course of travel. It was, we might say, it's just stuck out in the middle of nowhere. You don't go there unless you go there on purpose. This is the winter time, travel. They were fortunate to have their lives and to be able to be spared. And the Bible says that they remained, they remained there for three months through the winter months. Now, not only did nobody ever come there, but nobody ever stayed at Melita through the winter. There's other things to do. Who wants to be stranded on this little God-forsaken island where there's nothing to do, nothing that, that you can uh, do, and especially in the wintertime. But if you'll notice there that the Bible says that evidently there was another ship that came in a little bit prior to the storm, and it stayed there. It was intact. And it stayed there also throughout the winter. And so when, when Paul and all of the others, when they were ready to set sail, there was a ship that was already supplied for them to be able to go to where they were going. Now, in Paul's case, of course, he's on trial. But we see how God helped him and ministered to him through all of that. But here's my point. Do you feel in your life sometimes you're in a God-forsaken place? 
a dark place where nobody knows where you are. There's been shipwreck in your life. You're cold. You're weary. You're tired. And thoughts of saying, I can't go on. I don't want to go on. I don't have the strength to go on. Church, I want to remind you that God always has a ship that's ready to sail. That's ready to take you on in the places, in the life, in the depth, in the height, in the closeness that he wants you to go in your relationship with him. We talk about our ship has come in. Well, praise God, there's always a ship that's ready to sail. When you think that you can't go on, when you think this is it, this is what's going to define my life, this little out-of-the-way place that's going to destroy me forever. No, no, a thousand times no. God in His love, in His providence, God in His omniscience, His all-knowingness, He knows how to supply. He is a truly a Savior that is ready to save no matter what our condition is. So I just want to ask you again today, these admonitions through the Word of God and that has been demonstrated as in a video here before us in the life of Paul. One of the major events, but insignificant in a lot of ways, but yet uh, in great detail, Dr. Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, put it all in there. Ready, 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 ready. How ready are we, church? How ready are we? And I want to want to ask that point again. Are we ready to meet the Lord? Are we ready to be saved? True story. It was many years ago, but uh, church was talking about soul winning and telling everybody you came in contact with when the opportunity arose to uh, ask people and said, don't ask them, do you go to church? Are you a Christian? But just ask them, are you ready to go to heaven? If you were to die this moment, would you go to heaven? Ask them that question. There was a doctor in the congregation and one of the first patients that he saw he sat on his little stool and swiveled around and after he had checked them out and he said are you ready to go to heaven and the person almost fell out of the bed thinking they had some serious disease but he's simply asking about their heart their real heart are you ready church are we ready we never know when the Lord's coming. We never know when we're going to be, we're going to die. Are we ready? Are we ready? If we aren't ready, I'm so thankful that the Lord is always there ready to save. It doesn't matter when, where, or how. doesn't matter your circumstance. doesn't matter your situation. Jesus is here today with arms wide open and saying, this is your moment. This is your time. I have a ship that's ready to sail, and I want to put you on it, and I want to give you the ride of your life in service unto me. Father, I thank you today. I praise you for another opportunity to worship you. I thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to come into your presence, to open your word, to allow it to speak to us and challenge us and to change us. But Lord, as we think about this marvelous scenario in the life of the Apostle Paul, of where you spared him and all of the crew along with him and all of the passengers, 
God, that this theme of readiness, readiness, no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, no matter how much we may be hurting, no matter how much we've suffered shipwreck, no matter how cold we are, no matter how weary and tired we are, Lord, that we've got to stay in an attitude of readiness for whatever comes down the pike in our life. But Lord, I thank you most of all that you are always right there, ready to save us spiritually, ready to deliver us physically, financially, emotionally. You're always ready to save us and help us. We give you that glory for that. And we ask it in the name of Jesus.